Here I am again with another in my series of documentaries on Heathkit's digital multimeter series. And as usual, I'm going to start with Chuck Pinson's excellent book, Heathkit Test Equipment Products. Flip to the frequency counters and digital multimeters chapter. And uh, I'm going to do this quicker than I have on the other ones because I've repeated the information quite a few times. But uh, Heathkit's first digital multimeter was the IM-102. It came out in 1972 and was made through 1978. To have a more affordable, more hobbyist level product at the same time, 1972, they came out with the IM-1202 which was reduced accuracy and less professional construction and most significantly only a two and a half digit display instead of the three and a half digit display that the 102 had. But a huge drop in cost from about $250 to $90. Within three years the uh, Heath Company apparently decided that the styling on the 1202 was outdated and they replaced it with a more bench top piece of equipment the 1212 which was the same circuit as the 1202 just packaged differently and leaving off the um, polarity switch probably as a cost cutting measure or maybe it just didn't fit well on the the package they envisioned this only lasted for one year before Heathkit essentially reissued the same product but with an LED display instead of a Nixie tube display like all the preceding models had. Again, basically the same circuit except for the a few cost cutting measures here and there and um, the change of display type and going to a plastic enclosure. Around the time these two devices were disappearing and the discontinuation of the 102 in 78, Heathkit already had a couple of meters. First the 2202, which again was a more professional device um, with a really nice panoplex display, beautiful display. And a couple years later, coinciding with this being the only affordable meter they had still in production, they also came up with the 2212, which was, uh, again, a much more professional unit and the only one of Heath's many digital multimeters that had uh, auto-ranging. And it used an LED display. In amongst there, Heathkit came out with the 2215, which was a handheld digital multimeter. Their first of the type came out in 79, carried it through 1986. Fairly successful model. And uh, when you could no longer get any of these models, Heathkit replaced them collectively with a series of uh, very similar digital multimeters, the IM2260, the IM2262, and the IM2264. LED display, LCD displays. Otherwise very similar circuitry, similar specifications, but every time you went up a model, of course the cost increased and they would add something to it that the lower model or models didn't have. So in this case, they went to the LCD display from the LED display. They added an extra range on the low end of the ranges and uh, made a couple of other tweaks to the circuitry that just made it a little better protected, a little more stable, a little more accurate, but not dramatically so. Very small difference in specifications. And then finally getting to the subject of this video, the IM2264, which I've just completed in the course of doing my documentary research. I studied the schematics and indeed the circuit boards for these two models are identical, uh, populated with the same components, uh, same specifications, 
no differences. The only thing that the 2264 has to bring to the party is it has a peak reading analog meter next to the LCD display. These days uh, it's common to have LCD display multimeter, digital multimeters with a little bar graph on the display underneath the numeric readout which performs a similar function to what this little meter here did. And they also added another button for an alarm function which allowed it to act as a audible continuity tester and a couple other ways of using that. And finally they added an LED just to the left of the LCD display which was the crest warning. And this would come on uh, to indicate that you were out of range on various ranges and thereby you didn't actually have to be reading the display you could just see the LED wink on maybe out of the corner of your eye or something so possibly of dubious value but those are the differences as such I'm not going to do as thorough of a documentary on the 2264 as I did on the others in the series I went through them in great detail I'm going to be covering the same bases but I'm going to be shortcutting some things and especially in the circuit theory I'm not going to re-describe the entire circuit I'll just concentrate on the parts or the circuits that were added to implement the alarm the peak meter and the crest warning LED I should mention that the 2264 was discontinued in 1987 so it lasted for five years but it did not outlast the 2260 which was the LED version the least expensive of the series and unless you really wanted the super low end of the ranges this worked just as well as these other ones and if you didn't want the bells and whistles this was actually I think really the nicest meter of the series To be complete, I have to also mention that the uh, IM2320, which was Heathkit's second digital handheld multimeter, replacing the 2215. So I have to give mention to that. Alright, here's the internal view of the IM2264. Looking at it from the left side, here's the battery holder mounted on the rear panel. It has a small sub circuit board, which isn't really a circuit board. It's just circuit board material on a couple of standoffs, and it's used to hold the AC power adapter jack. But there are no traces or actual circuitry on this board. The IM2264 is essentially an IM2262. The uh, whole rear end of it, except for the uh, extra cutout here and some of the silk screening on there. This metal bracket, well I should say that differently. What you're seeing is just like a 2262 but it has a different rear panel with different silk screening uh, and that extra hole for the reset button. It has this extra a bracket that supports a circuit breaker. The holes are there on the 2262 circuit board because it's the same circuit board. It's just not used on that model. The display board's identical. The front panel, as far as the aluminum and the brackets on it, is identical to actually all the meters in the series. The IM2260, the 62, and the 64 the jacks and all that's the same and indeed the uh, laminated plastic layer is virtually the same as the 2262 but it does have an extra graphic for this button called alarm that is not there on the 2262 and nor is the square cutout for that button because that button does not exist on the 2262 uh, and of course this little insert label is different and the gray plastic bezel which is a separate layer 
in a sort of a sandwich has the extra hole for a crest warning LED and the graphics but it has the same cutout and meter installed for the peak detecting meter so that's all just like a 2262 so really the things they've added includes a crest warning functionality an alarm function a circuit breaker on the rear for the amps a hole on the rear to accommodate the circuit breaker and this add-on circuit board which is not part of the 2262 although once again the main circuit board on the 2262 and this 2264 is the same board and if you had an, a 2262 there's a row of holes on this circuit board which you could plug one of these uh, auxiliary boards into it's just not used on the 2262 so uh, what does this uh, this add-on board do? Well, it includes three ICs and a trim pot, handful of discrete components, and uh, essentially what that's doing is it's providing the extra circuitry to operate this LED on the front for the crest warning. There is a piezoelectric buzzer mounted to the display board uh, which is not mounted there on the 2262 but there's a place for it uh, the circuitry to drive the piezoelectric buzzer is on this board basically everything which is not required on the 2262 but is required here is either that buzzer on this board that's been added or it's on this board I'll just flip the display board up and tip it back. So um, I've already covered the circuit board on the 2262 and I've decided to make this video a little shorter by not repeating a lot of things that are common to both models. I'll let the 2262 be the definitive video and this 2264 being a video limited primarily to things that are different between the two models. So you've got your main uh, jack here that's the positive used for everything except the 10 amp range and its lead comes over here and goes directly to one of the function switches. All the function switches are here all the range switches are here and there's a lot of wiring you can see diagonal wiring and bus wiring that's all done with sort of a wire wrap and then soldered I'm not sure if Heathkit called for it to be soldered or not, but it was wire wrapped and they provided some sort of a little tool uh, and instruction on how to do the wire wrapping. And of course all these switches, in addition to common and uh, series busing, uh, the rest of the switch contacts go into the circuit board and are done with foils on the top or the bottom of this double sided circuit board. The capacitor here is used on the input when you're in the voltage mode, either AC or DC volts. Uh, if you're in DC, it bypasses this capacitor. If you're in the AC volts mode, this capacitor is in series with the positive lead here. And that is so when you're measuring AC that any DC component of the signal being measured is blocked by the capacitor, so you only are measuring the DC part of it. There's the power switch down here. This does not switch AC power, it switches the battery voltage. Or if you have an AC adapter plugged in, it switches the DC coming from that. And it doesn't actually have any circuit board foils, it all goes over this ribbon cable to the back of the, uh, to the meter circuit. Over here is the peak detecting meter on a little bracket that holds it in place. And while I've got the display board out here, I'll just look at this briefly. So this has the ICL7106. That's the monolithic uh, digital voltmeter IC that does all the actual voltmeter functionality and also the display driver for the LCD. The LCD is on a bracket that has a reflective surface because this is a transflective LCD. So the LCD itself is transparent 
and light from the room passes through it once, hits the reflective metal plate, bounces off of that, reflects, and comes back out through the uh, transparent part of the LCD, and that's what you see. So there's no backlighting on this. Instead, it gets its light source from the ambient lighting conditions. That's why it's called transflective. Uh, these days, we tend to not do that quite so much. Uh, backlighting is quite common. And instead of this metal shiny plate there, their modern equipment would probably use a very similar LCD, but they would put a, a backlight behind it instead of using that shiny plate. Here is the piezoelectric uh, element, the transducer. That is not a buzzer. Um, if you just power it up, it wouldn't make any sound. It only makes a beeping sound because electronics are driving it to do that. In that sense, it's just like a, a speaker. It needs to be driven by an audio signal in order to make an audio sound. The um, board has one, two ribbon cables going to it, and also a uh, shielded cable through which the actual signal being measured is uh, supplied from the main board up to here. Let's just take a peek at the rest of the main circuit board, the part that's not covered with function and range switches. There's a um, op amp there. That's the, um, let's see, is that the... Yeah, that's the buffer amplifier. That's the amplifier that goes between the input range selection uh, resistors and it drives the uh, the meter board basically the the voltmeter board and it has sort of a gear shift on it as I described in the IM2262 at some length it can either have a times one amplification factor or a times ten factor so either the signal coming from the front end of the meter just passes through and gets buffered or it gets buffered and multiplied by ten and that allows uh, the front end circuitry to be a little simpler and it allows that expensive component, the precision uh, probably laser trimmed uh, voltage divider that is that big white slab to be a simpler less expensive part. All these capacitors either fixed or trimmer types are there as AC compensation for the resistors that are in the white package. Then right next to it is another op amp and a row of potentiometers and some resistors and some other stuff um, that small round can right in the middle of the picture is a I believe that's a voltage reference IC looks like a transistor but it's really an IC so that along with the op amp along with all these trim pots and these other resistors here form the precision constant current source that's used for the ohms measurement modes. Then up in this area we're supporting uh, everything from there, that large round can, the surrounding components, and down to these trim pots right there. That's all part of the um, AC converter which is what converts AC signals to DC signals whenever you're in AC amps or AC volts. And um, that round package is an IC, but it was common at the time this meter came out for some ICs to be in a round package instead of a, um, a dip package that we're more familiar with. Um, so that particular device is an IC and it's a special analog devices chip that provides a true RMS AC conversion functionality all in one chip with a handful of support components and some trimmer values for zeroing and analog to digital calibration for example and the AC calibration all there on those three black trim pots. Up here that whole row of 100k resistors some of which are under the circuit breaker 
and all the diodes next to it and these transistors there and these three CMOS ICs are all part of the circuitry that takes the range and function switches which are brought their status is brought over through these uh, couple of ribbon cables here from the front panel wiring and so this circuitry takes the various combinations of function and range and determines from that things such as where should the decimal point be at a given moment on the display uh, should the buffer amplifier be in times 1 or times 10 mode should the uh, buffer amplifier have its filter function turned on or, or not uh, other things like that are handled in diode logic with a little help from some uh, integrated circuits there's an XOR gate there there's an OR gate there's a, a NAND gate package so that's all that decision-making process that's really the only part of the circuit board that's logic down here these are precision reference resistors that are used for calibrating the ohms function of the meter all these Heathkit meters have built-in circuitry to provide reference signals so that you can calibrate the meter without needing another meter to do it you can always do better if you have laboratory standards available but if you don't you can at least get the meter to meet its specifications by using just the inbuilt uh, or integral references this I see here uh, it's a 4011 it's another CMOS logic chip and some of the immediately surrounding components like this capacitor and a few resistors down there and this uh, jumper which has three positions this forms a precision uh, AC reference signal uh, both a, an AC signal uh, in the form of a precision square wave and a, um, a reference signal that's a DC signal but it's taken off the amplitude of the uh, AC waveform and that's also used for self calibration but this is basically there to provide a known uh, square wave signal with a known amplitude which is used to calibrate the analog to digital converter so again this is part of the integral self calibrating reference circuitry this circuitry over here uh, there is another if I look for it enough I'm not sure where it's at um, I'm not spotting it but um, it's around there somewhere there there's a uh, reference another reference I see that looks like a transistor and along with this trim pot and a few support components around there it provides a reference voltage that's used for calibration and also it's used by the uh, monolithic voltmeter I see on this board as a reference signal so that comes from this area and like I already said this board here has the circuitry on it to provide uh, the oscillator to drive the piezo uh, transducer on the front panel or on the display board here for making beeping noises and uh, it also has uh, op amps that are used to drive the well it's not to drive the meter because that's already on the main board but it's there to drive things like the um, alarm function on here and also this uh, crest warning LED so those are all built into this board and then finally we've got oh yeah not finally I have to look over at this side of the board over here is where the negative terminal from the test leads comes in and goes directly into the board here and then goes out through foils but 
this here is a 0 0.01, I believe, 0 0.01 ohm precision shunt resistor, and it's located as close as it possibly can be to the 10 amp input jack. So that gets wired directly here and it goes right over to the end of this resistor, and the other end goes as close as it can to this resistor. So the 10 amp current path only has to go through here, just in that little loop. And this is a um, a four terminal device, so two of the leads are used for the resistor and that's what the uh, potentially 10 amp current flows through that way. The other two leads are used to measure the voltage drop across the resistor. So you're not getting a measurement error by the voltage drop in these wires. <laughs> there can be a substantial voltage drop when you're only talking about 0 0.01 ohms you can get enough error in the voltage drop just because of the resistance of those short pieces of wire and that's why that's done this way. And then um, this is a wire wound resistor precision type and then there's a progressively smaller set of uh, precision resistors that are all part of the ranges for the um, amps measurement. They're all shunt resistors and they get wired in series with each other and then depending on which amps measurement range you're in, the switches short out or select different combinations of these uh, shunt resistors to get the proper voltage drop which is then used by the meter to display the current. And these uh, four large diodes here are part of the protection circuitry when you're in amps mode that these uh, essentially form a short circuit above a certain voltage drop. As typical when you're measuring amps with shunt resistors, the resistance is made to be small, so the circuit that you're inserting the meter into doesn't see a huge voltage drop. Uh, so it's as unintrusive to the circuit being measured as possible, and therefore there's only a, a small amount of voltage, it's only 0.2 volts dropped across these shunts, worst case 0.2 volts dropped across it. And these diodes have, you know, probably 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts forward drop. And they're actually in series. Um, so two of them are in series for positive overrange, and two of them are in series pointing the other way for negative overrange. And there's a couple of um, 10K resistors that are floating around here somewhere. I don't know which ones they are right at the moment, but they've got to be close. And those resistors use the plus and minus 8 volt power supply on the meter board to pre-bias two out of the four diodes. Um, not absolutely sure why they did it that way. Uh, certainly other meters do it without using that approach. But I think it may uh, improve the response um, of the way these diodes are working by doing it that way. All right, so then let's finally get to the power supply circuit. Oh, yeah, this is the um, the fuse here. This is for the uh, everything except the 10 amp range. And on the other meters in this series, the IM2260 and the 2262, it's a 3 amp fuse. But on this model, the 2264, it's a 10 amp fuse. And it can be that way because it's wired in series with this circuit breaker, which is, um, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's something on the order of like 2.1 amps or something before it trips. So this is actually providing the front line protection when you're in the normal amps mode, any, anything except for the 10 amp mode. So this provides the front line protection, but if this didn't provide the protection for some reason, then this fuse being set to a higher value would eventually pop. And remember, this is both the circuit breaker and the fuse are in series with these diode clamps here that will essentially short the input out if the voltage drop across the shunts gets too high. So it's when that happens, then all of a sudden you've got a lot more current flowing and one or both of these protection devices will trip and open up the circuit.
Okay, so finally getting to this last corner of the main circuit board. This power transistor, these couple capacitors, this little dinky transformer, these other capacitors, a few diodes, a transistor, I think this is a Zener diode down here, or maybe it's this one. This chunk of circuitry here operates as a kind of a switching power supply. So it oscillates, it provides an oscillator, the oscillator drives the primary of the transformer, the secondary of the transformer is tapped off through a rectifier diode to provide uh, positive uh, voltages within the meter power supply and the primary is actually tapped off because when the transistor opens you get the reverse voltage that's developed across the primary as the field collapses and since that's the opposite polarity that's rectified and provides all the negative voltages and then there's a tap off of the secondary which is fed back through a Zener diode and a transistor that's going to be this one probably uh, which in turn drives this transistor and that's how it knows how hard to hit the primary in order to keep the output voltages proper that's the way the voltages are regulated in here is by fine-tuning the oscillation of this uh, part of the power supply and um, I'm thinking it's probably these two transistors here I think that's probably the ones there are a couple of transistors that are used they play a part in reducing the regulated voltage that's produced by the circuit over here that provides a plus and minus 12 volt set of power supplies but the meter also needs plus and minus 8 volts and so I think that's what these two transistors are doing there they're part of that circuit and then there's also tapping off of there and uh, there's the uh, Cal high and Cal low a couple of reference voltages that are used in the self uh, self calibrating functionality of the meter so I think I've covered pretty much everything that's on there all right let's just look at the front panel again it's very similar to the IM2262 that I've already covered and so I'm gonna shorten this part of the discussion not go over everything in as great a detail but you've got your power switch here you have two voltage ranges one for DC volts and one for AC volts two current ranges or amps ranges DC current and AC current and your ohms range so the functions are derived here on these five switches and then the ranges of which there are six are done with these six push buttons if you're in the voltage ranges AC or DC you've got 200 millivolt full scale 2 volt full scale 20 volt full scale 200 volt full scale and if you're in DC volts you can go up to 1000 volts DC this is really a 2000 volt range but due to some limitations of components in the meter it's only safe to use it up to 1000 volts and if you're in AC volts you have the same thing here but it's limited even further it's recommended to not go over 750 ohms even though as far as the meters concerned it's a 2000 uh, volt range if I said ohms or something when I was talking about this before I meant volts <laughs> and then um, there's also this additional uh, range a sixth range and that's for battery test it just connects the meter across a voltage divider which is across the battery and it puts it in a mode where it's expecting to see 20 volts so it'll normally display somewhere in the 6 to 9 volt range uh, the batteries would only develop a little more than 6 volts uh, but if the AC power adapter is plugged in it's going to be maybe more towards 8 or 9 volts so they're basically saying if you get a reading greater than 6.00 the battery's fine or the power supply is fine. If it's less than that, you should think about replacing the batteries. Um, if you're in amps, DC or AC, you've got a 200 microamp full scale, a 2 milliamp full scale, 20 milliamp, 200 milliamp, 2000 milliamps, which is 2 amps, and a little hard to see because it's white on light blue, 
is the 10 amp range. Now they no doubt made that white so that it color codes with the white jack. They're telling you because this is a reminder if you're going to put it in this range you should be using the white jack. Uh, so all measurements are made using these two jacks unless you're in the 10 amp range in which case you use these two jacks. And then if you're in the ohms mode you start with a 200 ohm full scale 2 kilo ohm full scale 20k 200k 2000k which is also 2 megs 2 mega ohms and then finally a 20 mega ohm range and then finally the other things that are on the front panel we have a crest warning light that provides a couple different functions there is the LCD display itself there is the peak reading meter which just shows whatever this is showing but with a lot less accuracy but it allows you to see trends where here it might just look like a, like a jumble of rapidly changing numbers but here you could visualize that maybe you've just got a rising signal or a decreasing signal or a signal that's pulsing you could see it easier here than you could with what would just seem like a jumble of rapidly changing numbers the IM2262 has all the same stuff except it doesn't have the crest warning and it does not have this button here for the alarm. The alarm is different from the crest warning. The alarm can be used as a beeper in continuity testing mode and it can also be used as an alarm that comes on if you're uh, overranging any particular range that you're in. This meter came with a set of fairly good-looking NICAD cells installed. They had not leaked, but I don't want to leave anything like old NICADs, or for that matter, alkalines in any of my test equipment. Uh, just That's going to sit around for years. Um, since I have these mostly to collect and not to use, I don't want them to get ruined by batteries leaking out of sight and out of mind. So I make sure they're always powered externally. And... Uh, as I mentioned in the 2262 video, Heathkit did provide an AC power adapter that applied to this whole range of meters, and I make uh, clones of it. It's the uh, PS2350, and I just make the clone out of a uh, little generic wall wart because the Heathkit one was nominally in the 8 to 9 volt range. I make sure I buy a 9 volt regulated supply and the smallest one in this series is half of an amp which is way more than it needs to be to power this so that's an inexpensive reliable simple fix the only problem is um, coming up with the right connector because nobody uses the type of connector Heathkit did for powering things anymore although it was common in those days barrel connectors were not that common yet Instead, the good old phone style connector was used for power um, in just all sorts of things. And this is a 0.1 inch diameter phone plug, so it's even smaller than the common uh, eighth inch diameter phone jack that you see on things like um, earbuds and a lot of headphones these days or you know never mind the quarter inch jacks that predated those this is actually a very small one and Heathkit loved using these things and the only plugs I can find today is some Chinese ones that are made so poorly they fall apart as soon as you try to touch them with a soldering iron and then if you want to spend a bit more money in the order of five dollars each Switchcraft makes this I believe um, I, I can't remember the part number anymore it's like an 850 something and and it's made by Switchcraft. Uh, if I can remember the part number I'll put it in the caption. But it's a high quality jack with terminals that don't melt when you touch them with a soldering iron and the body is a machined aluminum black anodized body. So that's what I end up putting on the cable from the power adapter. So a little bit about the restoration of this meter. I bought this meter and my IM2262 
from a fellow in the Nashville area. That's Tennessee. And uh, he had built both of these and used them. Uh, well, the 2262 and this 2264. Did a good job building them. I don't really have any complaints over his workmanship. But they were used a lot. And uh, if you watch my 2262 video, you'll know that the main problem that one had is that the batteries that were installed had leaked. And there was corrosive fluid and conductive fluid, as it turned out, splashed all around the rear uh, components of the circuit board, which was causing some really strange operation. And uh, it took quite a lot of effort to clean it up in a way that didn't make things worse. And there was just a, a huge cleanup operation back here on the rear panel and the battery holder. But eventually I got it good. And that meter was actually a little cleaner. This one I think saw heavier use. There was a fair amount of dirt on the front panel. Took quite a bit of careful scrubbing with Q-tips and um, little fragments of tech wipes held on the end of screwdrivers, soaked in isopropyl alcohol, things like that, to get uh, just the year, you know, many years of use, the dirt that accumulates on front panels where they're in contact with fingers and so on, and just dust and so on. There was a lot of crud on the LCD display, so I pulled that board off and gave a lot of attention to that, and got it looking pretty good. Um, unlike the 2262, the front panel had not delaminated, so I did not have to fix that. Um, the rear panel was pretty clean. The, the only thing that was really strange about this one, other than just physical cleanup, was that uh, all the readings were very unstable. They were always about the right value, but they were just constantly drifting around and I knew that the signal wasn't actually doing that, that I was applying, and I suspected there's a bad connection somewhere. And it took a little bit of doing, but I finally realized it was affecting all ranges, so it couldn't even be um, a lot of the parts of the circuit, like it could not be the analog to digital converter, it could not be the ancillary board, it had to be something in the front end switching and I didn't think anything there would cause it to drift around that way or it could be that buffer amplifier could have a problem with the IC but I said to myself you know that could be just as easily caused by something like um, some old flux on the uh, analog to digital converter chip here that's become conductive over the years but even that probably wouldn't cause the problem I was seeing. I thought, you know, it's maybe just a bad connection in the socket, and that's what it turned out to be. I pulled the IC out of the socket, cleaned its pins, put it back into the socket, and the problem went away. And uh, other than that, um, the voltage modes on here were spot-on calibrated. I went through the calibration but I didn't actually change anything because everything was reading so well. The only thing was that the, uh, all the ohms ranges were out, so I recalibrated those. Now, also for the restoration, the case here was pretty grubby. Um, again, as might, one might expect from its age and having seen a lot of use. So um, I did my usual trick of just taking everything off of it and then submerging it in a a utility sink full of warm soapy water and going over it for quite a while with a scrub brush and then going over it with um, isopropyl alcohol and was able to get most of the junk off of it. There's still some areas where things were a little hard to get off and I didn't quite get it all but uh, basically it cleaned up pretty well. And uh, two out of the four rubber feet on the bottom of the case had come off and were missing and the other ones were looking pretty rough. So I peeled those off, used adhesive remover to clean all the adhesive residue off, and then um, put on a new set of uh, four 3M bump-on feet, which are exactly the same kind Heath kit used, although a different color. They use sort of a gray color, and I'm using black, but other than that, this is as much as I could restore this.
I had to pull out these two aluminum brackets which are the same brackets used on the 2260, the 2262, and the 2264 that we have here. And I'd wondered why they had these gone, well, I wonder why Heathcote had gone through the expense of putting this angled square punch out in these brackets, which work this way or this way, so it's just a single bracket design. And now I know, because they have a reset plunger for the circuit breaker, with this mold or this um, yeah this molded plastic piece and a spring and uh, it has to fit through at an angle so with the button centered the paddle that actually hits the circuit baker is tilted over so it actually hits the darn thing so that's the whole reason for that and these get rotated into the case um, Let's see, yeah, it has to go this way. So they get put in, and there's um, slots in there. You move them to the middle of the case where those slots have a gap in them. And then they just get slid, well, or you drop them. And then finally the right side of the bracket docks into a channel on the right side of the case so it's pretty stable. And then you end up with the two brackets like that. Then to reassemble the meter, the first thing that has to happen is you have to move the handle out of the way. It gets raised up on its detents. And then the battery pack and rear panel get stuck through from the front, kind of like this. And then the uh, rear panel and battery pack starts coming out the rear. And there's just enough cable length to allow them to do that. And then the main circuit board assembly goes in from the front. There's a shield um, which is screwed to the bottom of the circuit board. And that has to be put in so it doesn't catch on the case when you slide it in. Finally, you get it almost all the way in, and then it just drops in like that. At that point, you have these holes on these brackets here line up with these brackets here, which are screwed to the circuit board, and also down here. And then those screws are put in in two places. And that supports the back of the circuit board this way and this way, keeps it centered, and nothing's moving anywhere in the case at that point. And it's safe to tip it up on its front because everything is recessed into the, the front bezel of the case. And you can kind of see now see how that angled paddle comes over on the button so that it can um, be used to mash down and reset the circuit breaker. So with all that in place, it's just a matter of tucking the power wiring into the back and sticking the rear panel and battery pack combination. In here you have to get the, the button through the hole. And that sits down into a recess. Now the original screws were missing on this except for a couple of sort of a hodgepodge of different types of screws. I don't think more than one of them was original. That black one might have been original. The others are all different. They're all 632, but uh, there were three of them. A fourth one was not even filled. So I just have some nice um, black button head hex drive 632 screws that I'll put in there.
so the AC power adapter you just have to get it aligned in there then it snaps in and there's enough of the uh, housing of the plug at least with the switchcraft one that there's a knurled part that gives it a good grip to pull it back out as I mentioned on my 2262 video Heathkit did use pull out detent locks on the handles unlike most of their meters which just relied on um, screws and lock washers so you could rotate the handle up for carrying you could rotate it to the back just to have it out of the way and there's still enough room to let the power cord get clear or it makes a nice adjustable bale or kickstand for the meter Because this meter did not come with any test leads, I just bought on Amazon a pair of these inexpensive basic uh, Elenco TL4 leads, which have simple banana plugs on one end, not the shrouded kind we're used to today that look more like this. But they're appropriate for meters of this vintage. And um, I find the quality on these is kind of all over the place or how you doing as Dave Jones would say uh, sometimes they're too loose sometimes they're too tight it all comes down to how much these uh, banana uh, flared metal plates I think that's why these are called banana plugs because they look like a partially peeled banana I have to bend those out to make them fit a little tighter There's the beauty shot. Okay, a brief demonstration. I'm going to start out with DC volts and I'm going to put it in the 2 volt range. I have my bench power supply set to nothing and I turn it on and I get nearly zero volts and I'm going to crank it up to 1 volt and I get positive 0.993 volts that is a characteristic of this series of meters at least the ones that the LCD displays like the IM2262 and this IM2264 that Heathkit decided to generate the extra display signals to display a plus, a plus sign for positive signals instead of just displaying a minus sign for negative ones and by absence of a minus sign you know it's positive they actually did the work to have a positive uh, appear there and uh, so that's one volt I go up to five volts and it overranged so I go to the 20 volt range and typical of the series there's a slow settling time there's quite a bit of capacitance at a couple of points in the signal path that get fed through fairly high value resistors so that tends to dampen out transients but it also means that it takes just a second or two to stabilize after a big change so 4.99 I actually tried to tighten that up but the trim pot was so touchy I couldn't get it any better than that uh, let's go to 12 volts 11.99 let's go to 22 volts and it's overranged. So I go to the 200 volt range and I've got a nice 22 volt display. Go to 24 and my power supply goes up to 32 volts. And that's as high as it goes so we've got that. Now I'm going to roll the power supply down and do it fairly rapidly so it's a little hard to see what's going on when you do that but if you look at the peak meter you know you can see the trend more readily perhaps with the meter okay I've got it set back to 24 volts
All right, I have the meter in AC volts, and this is primarily to check out the functionality of the AC converter, the true RMS AC converter. And I've got it in the 200 volt range because I'm going to be reading line level signals. I have a different pair of leads here which go into my benchtop AC access box, which I've got turned on. It's plugged into my Variac. I'm going to turn the Variac on and I'll start messing around with the voltage. That's about 50 volts on the Variac and 50.2 here. Go up to about 100 volts, right on the money. The meter on the Variac is not that accurate, but I already know from previous tests during calibration that this is quite accurate now. And if I go up around 140 volts, obviously the AC function is working just fine. You can see the uh, peak detecting meter there moving very nicely. Okay, so much for AC volts and AC signals in general on this demonstration. Okay, I'm going to go to DC amps. The uh, handles on this unit are a little bit tired. They keep wanting to spring out of their detents. Uh, Heathkit did a good job by putting detent type locks on the handle, but then they made the handle so wispy thin out of plastic without any metal reinforcement. That's really the, the failing on this meter design, I think, as far as the case part of it goes. Is they should have done they should have done what the more professional meters did and actually have a metal bale inside there and then mold the plastic handle around it, but oh well. It was probably stiffer when it was newer. Um, so I've got my bench power supply set to 24 volts. I have it wired in series with a 4 to 20 milliamp loop tester, which is a two-wire transducer, or a two-wire transmitter, actually. And that's in turn in series with the input of the meter. So DC amps, and I'm going to go to the 20 milliamp range. It has a very tiny offset there, which I tried to dial out during calibration, but the old trim pots are pretty touchy. They probably wouldn't have been that way when they were new. And if I just breathed on it, it got worse than this, so I'm leaving it the way it is. Anyway, so if I turn the power supply on, I'll get a red LED here telling me the loop is correctly wired and powered. What was the deal here? Why is that working poorly now? This is filmed a little bit out of sequence. I had uh, noticed an intermittency before when I was measuring milliamps and um, it seemed to be resolved and I thought it was just exercising the switches here but I realized it was clamping. I was getting full swing as verified by another meter in series so I knew the actual current was correct, but it acted like it was getting held to a small value, and I thought the only thing in the circuit that could do it are these overload protection diodes. What if one of those is shorted out? So I went around and looked at those diodes, and two of them had cracks in them, and I decided to just cut the leads to remove the diodes from the circuit, and as soon as I touched them, two of them just disintegrated. But as soon as I did that, I started getting proper reading, so that was the problem. So just to finish the demo here, and then I'm going to have to order some replacement diodes and install them and before I button this back up. Anyway, so with the milliamp tester, um, if I throw the left-hand switch, it should take it to 4 milliamps, which it does. Return the switch, it should go to about 12. Throw the other switch, it should take it to 100%, which is 20 milliamps, and it overranged because it's really up to 19.99. So I have to go to the 200 milliamp range where I get the expected 20. There is no calibration on this meter for current. It all comes down to the accuracy of the um, 
the the shunt resistors. There's no separate adjustment. But this also may be slightly out. I haven't calibrated it in quite a while. On the other hand, this meter says it is 20 milliamps or 20.08 and this is, you know, so it's a little out but not too horrible. Anyway, if I return this to normal, should go back to about 12 and by turning the knob I should be able to adjust it in the range from about 4 milliamps up to about 20 milliamps. So the current's working. And because I know the current range is working, the circuit is exactly the same as it is AC and DC, except for routing it through the AC converter circuit. And I know the AC converter circuit works because I already tested and demoed the meter in the AC volts mode. So all the circuit modules are working. And, uh, and rather than rig up something to give me AC amps, I'm just going to leave the demo at that as far as amps go. Okay, I have the meter in ohms mode and I'm in 200 ohms maximum range. I have the meter connected up to my Heathkit decade resistance box. And I'm going to dial in... There's a quiescent or residual 0.3 ohms in there. That's just the test leads and the wiring inside of here. So I'm going to go up to about 6 ohms there, and I've got 6.3, so same quiescent offset. If I go up to 8, yep, so that's working well. Let's go up to about 40 ohms. Well, it's a little different here, but again, I'm engaging more wiring in here. So that um, probably accounts for that. Let's go up to about um, 700 ohms. I overrange. So I go to the 2K range, and uh, yeah, 700 ohms. It's showing 0.7K because it's in a 2K range, so it's in kilo ohms. And let's bring in um, 3K here so it over ranges. I have to go to the 20K range, and it's reading 3.7 three here, seven here. That's good. I'll take it up to 7k, so 7.7. 7. I'll take that back down to zero. I'll dial it up to 40k. It overranged. Went to the 200k range. And I've got uh, 47, 47. Right on the money. I'll take that guy down. I should have just about 40. I'll go up to 80. Right on the money. I'll go up to 600k. It's overranged. I have to go to the 2000k range. Yep, pretty much right on. I'll take it up to, let's see, Three, so it should be about 630. Yep, that's all working good. So the ohms mode works. Alright, I'm going to demo the alarm now. I put it in ohms mode and just the 200 ohms range, which is appropriate for continuity, and I pushed in the alarm buttons. The audible alarm should sound. So I'm going to touch the leads together here. Well, hard to make a good contact. There. So that's what that sounds like. And um, otherwise, it should sound any time when the meter input is approximately 200 counts or 10%. Uh, of the currently selected range. So right now it's in infinity, but if I touch the leads together, that takes it down to zero, which is less than 200 counts. So that's one application of that. If I'm in the volts function, DC volts function, and go to 0.3, 
20, um, 20 volts. In this case, it should uh, go off whenever I'm over 200 counts. I've got it hooked up to my power supply again. And uh, I'm going to turn the supply on set to zero. And 10% of the range on the 20 volt range should be about 2 volts. So if I sneak up on this, I'm going to go to 1 volt, no alarm, 2 volts, and I got the alarm. Back down to 1 volt, nothing. I'm going to go up in fractions, so 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 1.9, hit 2 volts, and off goes the alarm. So that's how the alarm function can be used on this meter. Okay, so I'm going to take it out of the alarm mode. That just selects off. It's not tied into any of the ranges or functions. It's its own button. And uh, the crest warning function uh, on DC volts and amps, for example, it'll indicate if you've got an overrange, a substantial overrange. It has to be something on the order of 300% of the selected range. So I'm going to go down and select it to 2 volts. I've got the meter hooked up to my power supply still. So in the 2 volt range, if I go up to 1 volt, oops, I have to turn the supply on first. Go to 1 volt, nothing. 2 volts, nothing. 3 volts, I'm overranged, nothing. 4 volts, nothing. 5 volts, nothing. And now I'm up to 6 volts, which is 300% of the selected range, and I've got the crest warning. It doesn't make a beep, it just uh, flashes the light. So I go back down to 5 volts and it stops flashing. Uh, you can also use the crest warning in uh, AC volts or amps, in which case it's looking for a crest factor of 3.0 on the full scale. Um, so the ranging is a little different, but it works about the same way. And you can also put it on the 200 microvolt range. And then the crest warning indication can be used with digital signals. You hooked up to uh, plus uh, 5 volt TTL level, for example. And if you get uh, brief pulses, the light will light sort of like a logic analyzer or a, a logic probe, rather. So it can be used that way. So I'm not sure how useful that function is, but it's something that they included as a bell and or whistle on this version of the meter. Let's do the battery check mode. So I'm in DC volts. I'm going to go to battery test mode. And uh, I'm reading the power supply voltage from the AC adapter. If I just had batteries in here, then I'd be reading that voltage. So that's working. In the diode test mode, which uses ohms and volts at the same time, forward biasing the diode and checking for forward voltage drop, I have to have it in the 2K range, and I have to have it in both ohms and DC volts. The mechanical switch interlocks on the functions do allow those two to be pushed together. And then I've just got a typical silicon diode here. So I've just uh, put a couple of clips on the meter test probe points and then those are in turn clipped onto this diode with the positive side on the anode and the black side or the negative side on the cathode so it's forward biased. 
and it's reading the diode's forward voltage drop of approximately 0.6 volts, which is appropriate. Uh, and I forget offhand if it tests this in 1 milliamp or 10 milliamps. Either way, it's using one of the regulated uh, current outputs from the ohms mode, and then uh, it puts that current through the diode and then measures the voltage drop across it. So that's for that's working properly. And uh, since there's no specific buttons here telling you how to do this, there's this little note on the front, diode test C rear, and there is that little chart on the back plate of the meter that tells you how to set it up for diode testing. So to test for the rest of the diode functionality, I have to take it out of DC volts, but the only way to do that is to push one of the other functions and then push ohms again. And now I have to be in the 20 meg range. And I have to swap the, the polarity, the leads, like that. And it should read infinity because there should be no reverse bias leakage. So that's the, the degree to which the um, meter is able to test diodes. And by that same technique it can do a sort of perfunctory check of bipolar transistors, for example, treating those just like back-to-back -back diodes. It, it won't tell you the gain of the transistor, um, but at least it'll tell you if the PN or NP junctions are working properly. All right, here's the schematic for the IM2264. This one is pieced together from uh, separate printouts of smaller scans of the large original schematic. I don't have the actual uh, manual for the IM2264. I do have for the 2262. which I scanned and unfortunately I could only scan about a quarter of it at a time so this is sort of lopsided and taped together but it'll serve. So again I studied the schematics for the two products the 2262 and the 2264 and they are identical except for this dashed line area which represents the um, the meter alarm circuit board. The main circuit board of the IM2262 and 64 is an identical circuit board. There's no difference between the models, but there is a series of holes on the circuit board, the main circuit board, into which pins on this accessory circuit board fit. So you have an extra circuit board to build if you do the 2264. And then it solders onto the main board and adds the extra functionality of the um, alarm, the peak meter, and the crest warning. When I said that's the only difference, I made a small mistake there. Heathkit also snuck in a circuit breaker, which was added to the rear panel of the meter. That's a 2.1 amp circuit breaker. It's just wired externally from the circuit board and ends up being in series with the fuse, which is common to both models. However, on the 2262, because it's the only fuse, it's a 3 amp fuse. And here, it's going to a 10 amp fuse, probably to reduce nuisance blowing of the fuse since you've got the circuit breaker as the front line of defense. So that is the other change. Now to make it a little easier to understand I'm going to go to my usual hand sketch which I rearrange the components and unclutter them a bit to make it easier to understand. But of uh, importance here you've got your front end circuit here from your input jacks. This whole cluster here has to do with dividing down the input voltage so that it's suitable to the following circuitry. 
and this cluster over here deals with providing a resistor shunt of appropriate size when you're measuring current the current passes through the shunt resistors and a voltage is dropped across them and that voltage is of a suitable uh, scale and range to be read by the following circuitry and interpreted as current and then down here are all the ranges and the circuitry for the precision constant current source which is used when you're measuring ohms or resistance and it basically outputs the precision regulated constant current which goes out runs through the resistor under test and back to ground in doing so it gets a voltage drop across it which is proportional to the value of the resistance and then that voltage is measured by the rest of the circuit in that sense again it's just like the 2262 also identical is the so-called buffer amplifier which is just an op amp gain stage with protection circuitry a sort of active filter stage tied onto it and an alternate negative feedback stage both of them controlled by FETs nominally this is configured to be a unity gain or a times one gain amplifier so the signal coming in from all these resistors here simply gets buffered but it does not get amplified or attenuated it just passes through stronger but of the same value however if this le however if this fet is turned on by other logic then it changes the resistance values and makes this a times 10 gain factor so whatever signal comes in gets multiplied by 10 before passing on and also like the 2262 there's a single chip uh, monolithic true rms ac converter ic so when you're in ac ranges ac volts or ac amps the signal also comes out of the buffer passes through this gets converted from ac to dc where the dc signal is proportional to the true rms value of the uh, waveform the AC waveform coming in and you end up with where you would tap off of this circuit if you have a DC signal to start with and that would be DC volts DC amps or ohms you would tap off at this point and indeed it does that goes through some range switches and on to the analog to digital converter but if you're measuring AC volts or AC amps then you want the DC signal coming out of the AC converter so these switches select that instead of this and send it on to the analog to digital converter the analog to digital converter is identical to the 2262 with all the extra logic necessary to determine whether this amp should be in times 1 or times 10 mode whether or not the active filter part of it should be engaged or not where the decimal point goes um, things like that are all handled by this logic area over here and then finally um, we have the power supply which occupies this area so once again I'm now going to continue the circuit theory by studying the circuit in this area if you'd like to see a more detailed circuit analysis of this meter just go to my separate video on the IM2262 and everything I say in there is applicable to the IM2264 and after you watch that then maybe you can come back and watch this video again for the part that I'm going to start now where I'm just covering this all right here's my sketch which I've labeled as the IM2264 circuitry that is extra compared to what is on the IM2262 so let's start out with the voltage references section this is just a big uh, resistor voltage divider comprised of eight resistors in series with the positive 12 volt supply up here and the negative 12 volt supply down here tied between this junction and this junction 
is a 12.6 volt Zener diode. And at each of these junctions there's a filter capacitor just to help make things stabler. So essentially what you have now is a voltage divider comprised of six resistors that we know has 12.6 volts from one end to the other. And by the way, the center of the divider is tied to ground. So even if the plus and minus 12 volts aren't exact, if the power supply is cranking out a slightly higher voltage, you know, 12.1 volts or something up here, and maybe a little bit low down here, maybe it's minus 11.9 volts or something, because the resistor values are mirror images and because the center is grounded as a reference point then even if you have a skew at one end to the other the voltages that are tapped off here remain correct when, me when measured from ground. You essentially end up with a plus 5.3 volt reference here and then complementing that is a minus 5.3 volt Heathkit calls this 5.4 volts in their schematic, but doing the math, it's 5.3. Uh, then there's also a positive 0.2 volt reference, and while that same reference is developed on the minus sign, it is not actually used by anything. So those three reference voltages will be used in the subsequent circuit discussion. Okay, let's look at the uh, peak reading meter. This is the simplest part. So we're coming out of the buffer amplifier and we already know that that's always going to be swinging in a maximum of plus 2 volts to minus 2 volts. So a 4 volt span, 2 volts on either side of circuit ground. In other words, a 2 volt full scale signal. And that signal is taken down here and there's a voltage divider and assuming that this meter calibration trim potentiometer is in the middle of its range, which is normal design practice, you calculate the values assuming the pot is in the middle of its range, you would end up with 1.6 volts here assuming you're at a 2 volt full scale. And again the trim pot set to the midpoint. This op amp is configured as a non-inverting amplifier and the way this works is the op amp when it has negative feedback is always trying to adjust its output so that both inputs are equal. So let's just say you've got 1.6 volts here at full scale therefore the op amp is going to try to adjust its output to whatever it should be to get 1.6 volts here as well. Well, the you have a diode bridge here, a full wave bridge in the feedback path, so the output current goes through one or the other of these sets of diodes. Let's just say it's a positive voltage, so it goes through this diode, it goes in the plus side of the meter, comes out the minus side of the meter, then goes through this diode, and then back and it's heading back to the uh, minus input or the inverting input. The op amp again will adjust this point to try to get this point to be 1.6 volts assuming you're at full scale. Uh, the meter specifications say that it's a 750 ohm meter movement so it looks like a 750 ohm resistor and that it will be at full scale when there's 200 microamps going through it. So we can view this whole thing here, this whole part, as a 750 ohm resistor. Well if you do the math, oh yeah, I also have to remind you that when you have negative feedback the negative input acts like a virtual ground because no current flows into or out of the inputs of an op amp in a practical sense. So if we have current coming out of the output and going through here it must be going somewhere and therefore it's going to ground through this resistor.
Well, let's say that we know the op amp is going to be adjusting its output to get 1.6 volts, so let's assume 1.6 volts here. Do an ohm's law through this 8200 ohm resistor, we know we have approximately 200 microamps of current flowing. That same current, therefore, must be coming out of the output and going this way in order to have the same current going this way. And if we um, consider that this meter will be at full scale when you have 200 microamps, there you have it. A full scale value out here will result in a full scale current through this meter. If you have an opposite polarity, if this is in its minus 2 volt swing, then this would be minus 1.6 volts here at full scale, and you'd have current going the other way. It would be coming out of ground, going through this resistor, back this way, and back into the op amp, and it would be uh, minus 1.6 volts at this junction. All that means is now the current is coming this way, now it goes through this diode, still goes in the plus side of the meter, comes out, goes through this diode, and back into the op amp. So that's how the peak meter works. And by the way, since the op amp is always looking to get the correct voltage here, and we're not concerned with what the voltage here is, and these diodes are in the feedback path, their forward voltage drop, of which there's always two, because always two of them are forward biased and therefore conducting, those voltage drops are compensated for because the meter will increase its output by, let's say these are 0.6 volts each, so 1.2 volts, its output will be 1.2 volts higher than it would be if you didn't have these diodes in here in order to result in 1.6 volts back here. For the alarm, let's start out with the actual alarm itself. The transducer is a piezo transducer, and we're going to operate it at some frequency to make an audible tone. There's this little oscillator here made out of two inverters. They don't look like inverters, but they're XOR gates and they're operated in a way that makes them function as inverters. They follow the classic two inverter oscillator where you've got uh, equal value resistors coming from this input, from the junction between the two, coming to this junction, and then from the output over here, a capacitor coming back to this point. So resistor, resistor, capacitor, all meeting at this point. Doing the math on it, uh, it turns out that the frequency of oscillation is just a hair above 2 kilohertz. So, essentially we're producing a 2 kilohertz signal, but it's tapped off of here rather than here. It doesn't really matter. The whole thing is oscillating. And then that directly applies voltage to one side of the transducer, the other side of which is grounded. So whenever this oscillator runs, the alarm will sound. Now the oscillator can be started or stopped depending on whether this input here is on or off. So this is the enable for the oscillator to run. And that's driven from this comparator circuit here. It's actually a comparator and a level shifter. And that's in turn fed through the alarm selector switch on the front panel. If the alarm switch is off, as shown here, then the input to this comparator is tied directly to the ohm signal. This is just a signal which is plus 8 volts when you're in ohms mode and minus 8 volts when you're not. So we can treat it like it's an, an ohms on or off signal. If you have the alarm switch in off, like I said, then you're applying the ohms enable switch to the input to the comparator and you're also applying it to the input to this XOR gate. Now this comparator is basically just going to decide if this signal is high or low on or off in the case of the ohm signal and its output is going to be high, logically high, if you're in ohms mode and logically low if you're not. 
and you combine that with the raw signal and an XOR gate, its output will be off if both inputs match. So by this configuration, if you are not in the alarm mode, it doesn't matter whether or not you're in ohms mode or not, you'll get the same signal at this XOR gate and therefore its output will be low and therefore this alarm oscillator cannot run and therefore there will be no tone. That's how the alarm off functions. Now let's look at it when the alarm switch is on. Now we get the input to the comparator from the output signal of the AC converter. This point has got a signal on it whether or not you're in AC or DC volts or AC or DC amps. And it's fed directly into the comparator. Now the way the comparator works is it's an op amp but it's used as a comparator. A reference voltage is applied to one input. In this case the inverting input has a plus 0.2 volt reference and that came from this reference circuit here. 0.2 volts sounds suspiciously like one-tenth of the full-scale voltage that you expect to be having coming out of either the buffer amplifier or the AC converter because the uh, analog to digital converter is expecting a two-volt full-scale signal. So this is one-tenth of full-scale and indeed the manual says that the uh, alarm function is based on a count of 200 and on a three and a half digit meter a count of 2000 which we're treating as 1999 on the display uh, therefore the reference here is one tenth which corresponds to a count of 200 I think it's easier to think about it as saying one-tenth of whatever range you're currently selected in is the reference here. So the comparator is basically looking to see is the signal coming out of the AC converter greater or less than one-tenth of full scale in whatever range you're in. If that signal is bigger then you have a bigger signal on the plus input than on the minus input therefore the op the op amp output tries to go high. That's coupled back through a diode and then this one meg resistor to the plus input. And so then even if the signal drops a little bit, not by much, but let's say it just drops a little bit once it gets big enough to be larger than this, because of this hysteresis feedback the voltage here still remains high enough to remain greater than this and therefore it stays on. So it's kind of like it latches on but it doesn't really latch on in the long term. Once this signal here drops far enough now these two resistors and this diode act like a voltage divider. You're taking the output here subtracting the diode voltage from it and then taking that voltage and looking at this as a voltage divider with whatever the lower input signal is on the low end of the voltage divider and the output voltage of the op amp when it's at full scale which is plus 12 volts because that's what its power supply is minus the, uh, the diode voltage drop so you treat those two voltages at either end of this voltage divider and when the input voltage here drops enough that this middle part of the voltage divider falls below 0.2 volts then this will turn off and it will no longer be locked on or latched in. That is the hysteresis function and it's there because if you didn't have it and you had a voltage or a signal coming in here which was just right on the hairy edge of 0.2 volts the output would chatter. It would be one you know, second a little bit above, a minuscule amount, and then a little bit below. And instead of being a nice steady on or off value here, it would be, be buzzing around. You don't want that. Now, the, if you do the math here, it turns out where uh, there's a large difference between 1 mega ohm and 1,000 ohms. Uh, 
So if you do the math on this, just treat the voltage divider, you'll see that the hysteresis is a very small amount. So it doesn't have to drop very much here from the level that turned this on in the first place before the hysteresis allows the output to turn back off again, but there is a little bit of hysteresis. We have to do a level shifter here because the op amp is running at plus and minus 12 volts. So when the comparator is on, the output's at 12 volts. When it's off or low, the comparator output is minus 12 volts. We're going into a CMOS logic circuit now and th this chip is powered off of plus and minus 8 volts, so it's a different set of levels we have to work with. So, let's say the comparator is off, so it's a negative voltage here. This diode is reverse biased, so it doesn't conduct. Therefore, this resistor is like it's not there, and all we have is a 100K resistor from the input of this CMOS gate, to minus 8 volts, which is logic low as far as these are concerned because their, their lower power supply pin is also minus 8 volts. So in that case, when the comparator is low, we've converted the plus and minus swing to just a logic low signal here. When the input signal is bigger than the reference 0.2 volts, then the output of the comparator op amp goes high, which again is about plus 12 volts. In this case, this diode is forward biased and it applies 12 volts minus the forward voltage drop, let's say 0.6 volts, uh, to the top of this voltage divider, the bottom of which is minus 8 volts. With 18K here and 100K here, if you do the math, basically is converting the 12 volt signal to an 8 volt signal. And that is again appropriate as a logic high as far as these logic gates are concerned. So now we have a logic signal here which represents whether or not we're in the alarm range or not and we combined it in this XOR function. Remember that an XOR gate acts as an inverter uh, if you change one of the inputs from logic high to logic low. It will invert the other signal. So if you're currently measuring in volts or ohms, then this ohm signal is off, logic low, therefore you have a logic low here, and now you have this activity coming out of the comparator and when the XOR does its job on that you have a logic low here and say a logic high here when the comparator is on that just passes through because now this operates like an OR gate so this point here turns on when the comparator is on and it allows the oscillator to run when the comparator output drops the diode takes the comparator out of the circuit. This resistor pulls this input to logic low. And now you have two logic lows. An XOR gate will give you a logic low. So uh, the oscillator cannot run. Now if we're in ohms mode, this comparator is still working comparing to one-tenth of the selected scale, but now its output is inverted because now we're in ohms mode and this signal is high. So whatever the comparator output is, it gets flipped to the opposite logic state. So if the comparator says we're above 10% of the range, this, compar this uh, XOR will flip it to saying, no, we're actually below, and vice versa. I made a little chart here to show that. Here's the comparator output, logic high or low, in two scenarios, volts or amps mode and ohms mode. So if you're in volts or amps and the comparator output is logic low or off, the alarm will be off. If the comparator output is logic one or on, then the alarm will be on. However, if you're in ohms, the comparator being off results in the alarm being on, 
and if the comparator is on the alarm will be off. So that's how we get the alarm responding to less than a count of 200 when you're in ohms mode and more than a count of 200 when you're in volts or amps mode. And that comes in handy because the primary use of the alarm when you're in ohms mode is using the ohms mode as a continuity checker in which case when you have a value that's lower ohms you want to have the alarm because that's continuity and they recommend that you have the meter in the 200 ohm range although that's not an absolute necessity but that's best for continuity checking but you could use it in ohms mode and just say I want to alarm if the value is you know less than uh, one-tenth of the selected scale or selected range so now let's look at the crest warning so let's look at the third chapter of this sheet uh, and that's the crest warning once again we're presuming that we're going to be getting a signal that stays within a normally would stay within a plus or minus two volt range but of course there's nothing really stopping that if you have correctly selected the range then uh, it should never get outside of a plus or minus two volt span but if you hooked up a higher voltage or more current or something it could actually go quite a bit outside of that span and that would be an over range on the digital meter. So what we have here is two comparators, one of which responds to positive voltages and the other one which is responds to negative voltages. Otherwise they're very similar. They use two halves of an op amp which is powered from plus and minus 12 volts. And the comparator is very similar to the comparator I looked at down here for the alarm function. Uh, works the same way still has a couple of resistors and a diode in the feedback path but here instead of using a 0.2 volt threshold or reference voltage the positive comparator uses a plus 5.3 volt reference and the negative comparator the negative swing comparator uses a minus 5.3 volt reference and remember those come off of this big reference voltage generation circuit. This little front end part comprised of a diode, a capacitor, and a parallel resistor, that's a little sample and hold. Let's say your input is on the positive side of uh, zero volts. That would forward bias this diode and it would charge this capacitor up to whatever the voltage is here. But then if this voltage drops, to a lower value or even goes negative now this diode is reverse biased and it does not conduct it acts like an open circuit so now you just have this charge on this capacitor which represents the what the voltage was just a moment ago and it's slowly being bled down to zero volts by this resistor that's across the capacitor but that takes some time for that to happen you know I don't I didn't do the math, but let's say it's a half a second or something, or maybe one second. Something in that range would be appropriate. And then you start comparing that capacitor's voltage against the 5.3 volt reference. And if the signal is higher than 5.3, then you get an output here, which is basically plus 12 volts because the, the, there's no negative feedback to hold it back so the op amp output just goes to its positive supply rail. So let's say hypothetically that we're in a 20 volt range and you're up at 20 volts that gives you a 2 volt signal here and you have to subtract roughly 0.7 volts of forward voltage drop when this diode conducts so whatever you have out here is this voltage minus 0.7 volts. Uh, now let's say that we go to 300% of the scale, so now this would be 6 volts out here. You subtract the 0.7 volts and you have 5.3 volts. That's why this 
reference voltage here is 5.3 volts so that this signal needs to truly be three times full scale in order to get the voltage here after this diode's voltage drop to be the same voltage as the 5.3 volt reference. And then after that it works the same way. You have the hysteresis, it's a small amount of hysteresis, so the signal here does not have to drop very much for this to unlatch and turn off again. The same exact thing happens when you have negative signals, the diode's going the other direction um, because the polarities are all backwards, the polarity of this capacitor is backwards, and just because when you're trying to do a, a comparator using an op amp and you're applying the signal to the minus input, then the architecture of the circuit changes slightly. We apply the reference voltage here rather than to the minus input or inverting input, but at the end of the day it works the same way. So if you have a negative voltage that's more than 300 percent of full scale, then the output of this guy will turn on. So either comparator turning on will give you a high signal here. Uh, 12 volts they'll be minus the forward drop of these diodes and that will charge this capacitor and then that will be applied to this point here. There's a little bit of level shifting going on here. It gets it within the plus and minus 8 volt range of the CMOS logic which again is being powered off of a plus and minus 12, uh, 8 volt power supply and once again we have our old friend the two inverter oscillator except here we're using NAND gates as the inverters instead of using XOR gates as the inverters otherwise it's the same thing a couple of hundred K resistors and in this case the capacitor's value is much larger. Down here it was 2200 picofarads which gave us a 2 kilohertz signal. Here the resistor values are the same but it's two 2.2 microfarad capacitors in series which is a 1.1 microfarad capacitor. And the capacitors are electrolytic so they're put in series positive sides out that allows them to operate on an AC circuit. And if you do the math on that, it turns out to be about 4 hertz. Once again, this oscillator can only oscillate if this point here is turned on. So when either of these comparators is on, it drives through here, its voltage is adjusted to be within the plus and minus 8 volt span expected by an input here. It enables this gate, the oscillator runs. On the other hand, if neither of these comparators are turned on, then this resistor here acts like a pull down resistor. It pulls this point low and the oscillator stops running. Well the crest warning function is not supposed to operate when you're in ohms mode, only when you're in amps or volts mode. So how do we disable this uh, when you're in ohms? Well we have this same ohms signal which is plus 8 when you're in ohms mode and minus 8 when you're not and that's applied to another XOR from the same XOR that these three XORs came from. It's from the same IC and one of its inputs is tied to plus 8 volts which is logic high so we know that means this XOR will act as an inverter. So if you're in ohms mode here then this point here is pulled to minus 8 volts. So even if these comparators are trying to, uh, to turn this on by dragging this point forcibly low and not through a resistor, there's this pulled down resistor here but it's 470 K. In this instance we're pulling it down just through a diode, not a wimpy high value resistance. So it really does pull it low here even when these are trying to pull it high and that results in this point being low therefore the oscillator does not run. But if you are not in ohms mode then this is low that gets inverted to a high that reverse biases this diode therefore it's like it's not there and when the 
either comparator turns on, then this point can go high and the oscillator can run. Okay, to finish that off, the output of the oscillator, which is again running somewhere around 4 hertz, uh, feeds into this Darlington tra uh, transistor. I just drew it as a regular bipolar, but it's a Darlington bipolar, so it has more gain. That when this signal here is on, then the transistor conducts. When the signal is low, the transistor does not conduct. And we have the crest worn LED on the front panel, which is powered on its anode from the raw battery voltage, uh, in other words, not regulated. And uh, whenever the transistor here is on, then current can flow from the battery voltage through the LED to ground and the LED turns on. So the LED turns on and off according to the oscillation of this oscillator here. So the LED flashes roughly four times a second. Now on immediate inspection you'd say well that's going to burn the LED out because there's nothing in here to limit the current through the LED. It's just power supply, LED, transistor, ground. And when I first looked at it, I thought, well, that's a mistake. Heath gets screwed up on their schematic. Until I went back and looked at the, the big picture. And uh, here's the power supply. The battery comes in here. It's over here. This is the raw battery voltage. And here's where the BAT comes from, the battery voltage for the rest of the circuit. And it's got a 1,000 ohm resistor in series with it which originally I thought, why is there a 1000 ohm resistor in here? It's being used for testing the battery voltage by a voltage divider way over here, and that doesn't need to have this piddly little 1000 ohm resistor in it. Well, it turns out that that's there, apparently, only to provide uh, some sort of a, a current limiting for any circuits that are pulling off of this point. Of course, the other thing that uses the battery voltage is the main voltage regulator circuit that provides the plus and minus 8 volts and the plus and minus 12 volts. But when we're pulling off of here, you're either the um, voltage divider for monitoring the battery voltage when you're in battery test mode, and those are pretty high values, 113K and so on. Uh, so this resistor here is insignificant for that purpose, but we're when we're powering the uh, the crest worn LED, then this resistor does become significant and acts as the current limiter. So I think I have adequately covered all aspects of this add-on circuit that the 2264 uses. And again, if you want to see the rest of the circuit described in detail, Look at my video on the IM2262.